Pandemic, a reflection. What if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath, as some Christians still consider Sunday, the most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling. Give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray. Touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. And when your body has become still, reach out with your heart. Know that we are connected in ways that are terrifying and beautiful. You could hardly deny it now. Know that our lives are in one another's hands. Surely that has become clear to us. Do not reach out your hands. Instead, reach out your heart, reach out your words, reach out all the tendrils of compassion that move invisibly where we cannot touch. Promise this world your love, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, so long as we all shall live. So good day listeners, we just heard a reflection from our dear Bishop as we reflect on this time, such a time like this, this time of the pandemic when there are so many emotions running through all of us, different kinds of emotion. But hopefully it's one of trust in God that he will see us through. So we thank you Bishop for this reflection and the song that preceded this reflection opened the eyes of my heart which will bear um, some effect later on in our program. So we welcome all of you who are listening and those of you who join us on our Facebook page, uh, Diocesan Facebook page. We are very happy to be here with you today in spite of the circumstances. And we look forward to a conversation with our bishop, which will take a slightly different um, path today. Um, he has some very important instructions to give to us. And as bishop, we are called to listen. We also want to extend a very happy feast day to the St. Joseph's Convent of Clooney, those resident at St. George's and Grenville, and the schools, the principal, staff, and students of St. Joseph's Convent, St. Jo George's and Grenville. All those who bear the name Joseph, and especially this parish here, St. Joseph's Parish, and St. Joseph's Catholic School, Montjuloo, all of you, a very happy feast day, and to the entire diocese, may St. Joseph's protection be upon us. So, Bishop, um, I know a lot has been happening for you, and you have been found in a position where you have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and well, we, the we, first we, thing we I want to you. say is to add my own congratulations to yours, to all those who are celebrating the feast. Because it's not only the name of Joseph, huh? You have all kinds of derivatives from it. Josephine, Jose, Josie. You know, so many people can claim St. Joseph as their patron saint. So to all of them, we say, happy feast day, have a happy time. I want to apologize for my late arrival. I, I'm, I'm the one who held up the program, folks, because there are some very, very difficult things going on around us and I will share some of that with you as the program unfolds. The first thing I want to take up though is the ongoing developments born of this virus. We in Grenada have a lot to thank God for because in the last set of testing, the results of which came back yesterday, there still are no confirmed cases of COVID-19 on the island. That is something to really thank God for because I know that the government has worked assiduously, very hard, under a lot of pressure,
to try and pull things together. And we have to thank those who have been most active in the process, beginning with the Prime Minister, the Minister of Health, the coordinator, Dr. George Mitchell, you know, and all those people in the front line who are concerned about what is happening. I want to invite all of you, as I did on Saturday at the Mass, to really pray for those whom you know who are on the front line. It takes quite a decision for a nurse to decide that she will volunteer to work in the um, quarantine or isolation situations that arise. The doctors who work in those situations, I know at least two doctors have contracted the virus in different parts of the world that I know of, you know. And I, there's a danger that's going to be here once the virus is identified as being in Grenada. So we surround them with our prayers and we pray that they may have the strength to remain faithful and to be wise in everything they do. You know, because sometimes you, you're tired and you miss a beat and the next thing you know, you could be in serious trouble. So if you know somebody on the front line, pray for them. If you know somebody who's part of the coordinating committee, pray for them. And let us hope that we can keep Grenada going because like all our Caribbean islands, we do not have the resources to really meet this virus if it hits us hard. Up to now, Dominica and Grenada are the only two islands that have no cases, no confirmed cases. That's quite an achievement for us, but we know also that it's not our work alone. And in that regard, I want to make one thing absolutely clear. We cannot say that Grenada is free because God loves us because that means you're saying that he don't love the other places. That's nonsense from a Christian point of view. If we are free of the virus so far, we thank God for that while we prepare for what may come down the road. So that is the first thing. The second thing is, of course, we have to continue with what we have learned over the past two weeks. And, uh, but we have to carry that a little bit further. Physical distancing, as you know, is what we're asking people to do. Six feet, some people say, three feet, some people say, but the point is physical distancing in such a way that if somebody sneezes by you, the droplets don't come your way. The other thing, of course, is our handshakes, the physical contact. We say we stop that at mass and we receive communion in the hand. But as we look at Grenada, we understand that we have some practices which we have to reconsider. And one of them from a church point of view is funerals. And I was very pleased on Monday of this week to be able to join my brother and sister religious leaders from the um, CCG, the Conference of Churches of Grenada, and the Alliance of Evangelical Churches, as well as the Muslim community, to really sit and talk frankly about this and what is required of us. <clears throat> it was suggested, and we accepted that, that we need to keep our gatherings small and short, right? Now, I know it's hard for people if you say 50 is the limit, but we have to try and keep our gatherings small. So I will read to you what was decided, and I'll comment on it a bit. Effective yesterday, that's Wednesday, the 18th of March, all funerals will be private, whether held in a church or mosque or at the graveside. Funeral services, whether held in the morning or afternoon, will not be longer than half an hour, the service itself, and there will be no procession after the service. The funeral directors will be responsible for determining with the families what is to happen before the body of the deceased is brought to the church. At all times during the service and interment of the body, a physical distance of no less than six feet is to be maintained. The above decision was taken as a preventative measure. However, should there be an outbreak in the country, the directives from the government of Grenada will supersede the foregoing. First of all, I want to stress, <clears throat> this is not somebody trying to cramp your style. We have a crisis on our hands which can go 
worse than it is now. And we have to try to get people accustomed to behaving in a certain way. Hence, we're starting early. Funerals are the one occasion when people really get together in Grenada. And uh, I am on the inside presiding at a funeral, but I know what goes on on the outside. And there's a lot of talk and coming together, and I see you so long, and people are crying at the funeral and so on. And it's so easy to just hold on to somebody. You know? So we have to protect people from that. And when, in fact, people become infected, it's going to be even worse because it's going to mean that if somebody is infected in a family, the presumption is going to be that everybody in the family is in danger. What do you do then? So we have to begin from now to practice the safe practices and trust that we will be able to safeguard ourselves, our children, and especially the senior citizens. So. This morning I had a wonderful discussion with a lady who has a funeral coming up soon. And I want to congratulate her and to thank her for understanding. Right? Let us be clear, this does not mean that we are presuming that all our funerals are packed with COVID-19. But we do not know who and when. And if we don't take these precautions now, we can find ourselves in a more difficult situation. I want to suggest to people who have funerals that one of the things you might ask one of the young people to do is to use their cell phones to take a little video of the people at the funerals so that if anything negative comes out of it, and sorry, I shouldn't say negative, anything related to the virus, if one person comes down with the virus, at least contact tracing would be easier because you'd have the picture to look at, the video to look at, to see who was next to who. I think that's going to be very important in how we deal with this in any situation where there are a number of people present. So I appeal to families to look at that. So now let's take a break. And when we come back, you can call and ask your questions. Welcome back, listeners and viewers, to conversation with Bishop Clyde Martin Harvey. He has just given us some instructions for, as regards funerals and the arrangements that should be made. I'm sure you have questions on this. Maybe it doesn't all sit well with us, but as he has said, it may not sit well with us, but we can respond because he would like to know how you feel about what has been agreed on by the various religious communities. Uh, Bishop, there's one question about mm -hmm. violation of, you might say it's a public thing, yes, but then people have a right to just videotape or... Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> you see, videotaping is now something that happens in almost every context. Huh? Um, you don't know whether somebody's taking a picture or not. But here we're talking about the greater good. Here we're talking about the problems that our health officials have when they don't know who was sitting next to who or who was in the same area of any public function. And a funeral is, although we're trying to restrict it to family, it is still a somewhat public function. So that I think for the greater good, we should be able to know who was at the funeral. And this is for the family to do, not for some um, 
I'm a cautious person to come and do video and all that sort of thing. It is for the family to try to do it so that they can hand it over to the health authorities if that becomes necessary. Now, the, the other thing is that you mentioned the Conference of Churches Grenada mm -hmm. was part of the group that met. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess um, there was no mention of the Adventists. I know they're not part well, of the conference, they, well, but they were part of the... Yeah, um, everybody who I think has a place in, okay. the, in, in Grenada's religious landscape was there. It was a great meeting because I think it set the stage for greater cooperation later on. And I was really happy with that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing which I didn't go into, and which as we wait for questions, I think becomes important. We have become accustomed to funerals with mass, regardless of who. And I think we have to understand how that has happened. Before the Second Vatican Council, mass was not a part of a funeral. There was the funeral service, the liturgy. But there was the readings of scripture and the commendation of the body, which was the essence of the Catholic funeral service. Now, that can be done in 15 minutes. We are allowing half an hour, which gives us some time. Now, the half an hour does not include, and I want to stress this, it does not include if the family wants to come half an hour before that moment and uh, do a eulogy or something like that. We have agreed that that is something for families to work out with funeral directors. But we want to underline that that should not be a long period. Sometimes that can go on for two hours. And that goes on for two hours, and the whole set of people begin sneezing, and the next thing you know, we are in a very, very volatile and um, infective situation. So that's what we're trying to avoid for the present. You mentioned the times for funeral. Is that part of what should be arranged with the family? Yes. Or? Yes. One of the funeral directors was asking about having mourning funerals. And we insisted, as ministers of religion, that that's a choice for the family. If you want to persuade the family to do a um, mourning funeral and they agree, we will try to facilitate that. And I've already asked my priest to try to facilitate it. That if there is a mourning funeral, we, we do it. Um, but generally, it's either 10 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon that the service takes place. So if you want anything else, you have to come at half past 9 or half past 1. Okay. Okay. Now, concerning relatives, in this time, there's a cease on travel. And um, <laughs> that area is a very... Well, I mean, Ruthina, we need the compassion. <laughs> you, you are touching something very, very, very important. I think we have to take the hard decision that if somebody is dying, you say to your relatives, listen, don't think of coming for the funeral. You know, because it's going to be difficult. How do you come for a funeral and then have yourself quarantined for 14 days? When will the funeral take place? Especially when people begin to get infected. It's going to be hard. So again, I think we as church have to cooperate with people and to be able to say to them, listen, we will have the funeral with the body at this time and we are then open at another time. I mean, we do it with the tombstone thing that everybody comes together later on to celebrate the life of the person. I think that would be a fantastic thing. If Later on, when all of this is over, when people can come and go without fear, without knowing whether they'll be stopped. You know, you could imagine somebody coming for a funeral. And when they go back to the USA or England, they're told they can't go in. That would be disastrous, <laughs> you know. So um, we have to think about these things and think about them long and hard. But what we're trying to say is work within the constraints of the regulations which we have. And then God understands. Right. Bishop, at this time, it's, it calls for a big change, mm -hmm. adjustment in our, mm -hmm. the way we look at things. And yeah. it's really There's, hard to make this journey. But mm -hmm. as you another said, thing <laughs> which I have seen as going to be necessary uh -huh. is this happy hour that has become so much a part of the funeral. Um, I really have been quite surprised when people set up the happy hour in the cemetery itself. God, you know, have you no respect for the dead who are buried in that cemetery? You know, 
And there is no way that somebody can be consuming alcohol and be careful about how he shake your hand, whether he hug you up or not. There's no way that that is going to happen. So again, for care's sake, let's see what we do with this happy hour thing. If you want to wait until they, they be celebrating a year's anniversary and all of this is done. But, and this is something which I want to put before you. Um, one of the questions we have to ask is, what is God asking of us in these contexts? And I think when we look at this virus and we look at the demands that are being made, God is calling us not to see the end time, but to see his hand inviting us to conversion. And particularly in this business of whether we feel we have to have, we have to hug up people, we have to have alcohol. Um, hey, this is a chance to think and think again and to ask yourself, do we need all of this? And in that sense, I want to urge people to think about that third night tradition, because as a, as a moment when everybody comes together and you put the family through a whole set of expense and so on to feed and drink up and so on, I think we have to watch that, um, because that too can become a moment when people lose control and you have no um, control over what happens in terms of physical distancing. So all of these things are opportunities to think again. And that is why I will always come back to what I made my theme last weekend. This is a call from God to personal moral responsibility. Personal moral responsibility. And I've heard some beautiful stories, one of them coming out of the States just yesterday, you know, where a woman helped another woman. Um, by giving her two masks. And the other woman, instinctively, because they had kept social um, physical distance, mm -hmm. but when she opened the bag and saw the two masks, she was so happy because she was working in a difficult situation as a cashier. She instinctively, you know, reactive, she dropped the bag and ran and embraced <laughs> the person. Now, <laughs> The woman called me to ask for prayers. <laughs> but I think that's a great moment to understand who we are. And, to, and this is where I think faith in God really comes in. Faith in God does not come in to say, you know, well, God is going to make sure that I don't get the virus because I believe. Faith in God comes in when your love leads you into danger. And in that danger, you turn to God for help. You know? And... Uh, in a situation of war, when you give up your life to help somebody, that's difficult. But then you, you do it trusting God that God will see you through. Let's take a break now, Bishop. And mm -hmm. when we come back, we will continue with our conversation. Don't forget, 435-0143 is a number you can call to ask your questions, to make a comment, or you can post it on the Diocesan Facebook page. And so far, we'd like to thank all of you who are tuned in, listening here in the Caribbean and uh, New York. Thank you so much. We'll take a short break now. Welcome back, listeners and viewers, to Conversations with Bishop Clyde Martin Harvey. 
And we thank you for your comments and questions. Bishop, there's a question before we move forward. What is the church's position on cremation? Mm -hmm. Well, several years ago, the, the church began to allow cremations. Um, initially, it rejected the notion because it seemed it was connected with a lot of people saying, oh, we don't believe in life after death, so burn them. <laughs> you know? um, but the whole notion that the body itself will rise again is central to our Christian faith. But what we understand is that we will be given a new and a more glorious body. So what we have to understand is our bodies change during this life. And uh, we shall be changed, as Paul says in the letter to the Corinthians, from mortal to immortality. And what the immortal body will look like, we don't know. So the church says, you may cremate, yes. And there are special prayers to be said when a cremation takes place. But the ashes must be kept together. You don't go give one family member a piece of the ashes and give another family member. That the, the integrity of the ashes should be respected. That you don't scatter them in the sea. You may sink the urn to the bottom of the ocean, but you, you don't go around scattering the ashes on the water. The church advises against that because there is a sense in which we want to honor our dead and maintain that sense of their integrity, okay? So we allow cremations, and as a matter of fact, I don't think I'm saying any secret here, it is very possible that when the virus itself comes, whether it comes to Trinidad, to Barbados, or Grenada first, um, in terms of people dying, when it seems as if the best way to dispose of the remains of those who have died from the virus is to cremate them. Now, there are government regulations, which I haven't heard anything about on the radio, but I've heard about it in private conversations, where if a body dies of an infectious disease, the government takes possession of the body, control of the disposal of the body. So here again, it means that we have to respect that, because that is in the common good, in the interest of the common good. So it's not to say, nobody is taking my body. Please, if somebody dies of an infectious disease, the body, the disposal of the body is a matter for the government to ensure in the safest way possible for the common good. I don't like to think about it myself, but I know in situations in which it has happened that a disease becomes so infectious that many people die at the same time. And you have to just burn everybody in a common grave. I hope we never reach there, but that's something to think about. And that is not something that somebody will decide to do out of their wickedness. It is always in the best interest of all concerned. Another question before we move on. Someone is asking, can the service be extended to one hour? <laughs> um, well, in all, if you do um, the period before that, it will probably be an hour. But you know what happens to us? You say an hour, and uh, you end up with, <laughs> you know, two hours if you say one. We're saying 30 minutes for the service, but it's up to people to talk to the funeral director as to what time they bring the body to the church, how that goes, and so on. But I think in terms of the, the contagion that is possible when a group of people gather, and we are saying 20 people, 50 people, that varies from country to country. But what we have to understand is that once people are together, especially in a context of grief, it's very hard to separate them. So it is for your own good that we are saying, don't extend the service too long. Because the longer the thing goes on, the more likely it is that family members break down, that people lose control, and then anything can happen. You know. There's one more, and then we'll move on. <laughs> this person is saying that they think the, person, the body should be buried. Now, for the Muslims, they have a short time. They have it inscribed that the body is, you know, 24 mm. hours. We don't share that. But um, this person is saying they think the body should be buried, encourage burial rather than cremation. Wow. Now, that is a decision for the government to make. The government? Hmm? Yes, 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 yes. That's, that's, you see, 
Um, I think the, the, the Chinese from their experience have said that the only way to really be sure that the virus is not active is if you cremate. Right? Now, we, one of the problems with this virus is we don't know. You know. We've been saying that the virus is on surfaces. Some people are saying, no, the virus is in the air. We don't know. So we are in a very, very difficult scenario. Now, the government has to make a decision about the Muslims. Do they bury? Do they, are they allowed to bury, or do they follow the law of the land as it may be laid down, if it is laid down for cremation? If you lay down for cremation, you can't make an, an exception, because then you will have to make an exception for anybody who wants to bury. So I think we're, going, we're grouping in the dark with the, all the science, and we have to see what happens. Um, I would say that if you have burials, and by the way, we're only talking about not burying in a situation where somebody has died of the virus. The funerals that are taking place between now and whenever that first case comes up, we'll all go along with burial. That's not a question of cremation. If somebody has died not from the virus, they will be buried as usual. You know? In fact, some people are saying that they want graveside funeral rites. I have said I don't see a graveside funeral rite where you can hold physical distance because the way graves are, especially at top hills, you know, <laughs> people standing up on top of tombs and all that sort of thing, that's dangerous. Bishop, I guess it's, it's a, a grace of discernment and, you mm -hmm. know, all mm -hmm. that is applied yeah. at this time. And here I want to say, yeah. pray for your government. Pray for our government because there are difficult decisions to be made. Some people are losing sleep at night when they're faced with some of those decisions that they have to make. So let's support them, the medical professionals, the government officials, as they take us through this. I think we also have to know, Bishop, that there are many other conferences of bishops that are called in this situation to make decisions where the mm -hmm. situation has mm -hmm. arisen for them. Mm -hmm. So we probably are at a better point in the sense that we can learn mm -hmm. you know, from what is happening in, in other countries. But the patience and the compassion and the charity you know, sometimes people are a bit harsh with you because you need to understand. But it takes a journey too. And so, we, you know, we call on compassion to help people to come to this point, which is going to be new for Thank you for saying you that. Me. And that means, of course, that when you're not getting what you want, don't try to bully the funeral director or the priest or the minister. Please. That is uncalled for. As I said, the woman who I spoke to this morning was a wonderful example of how priest, minister, and a grieving person can talk about something and come to an agreement. Someone asked, this is, this is a hot topic right about now, how do funeral directors know the family members? When you uh -huh. say it's going to be a private something. Well, whoever comes, whoever comes to make the arrangements for the funeral will have to be seen as the person taking responsibility for deciding who comes. That's a hard one, except yeah. you really mark it off. It's private. <laughs> yeah, the main thing here, though, is, and we have insisted that people should be able to bring the, the, their deceased relatives to the church. All of us have insisted on that. One group was trying to say, no, you just have it in the funeral agency or by the graveside. We said, no, we as ministers cannot encourage that. But once we accept that, Somebody has to take responsibility for making sure that the social distancing is held, especially in those contexts where the deceased has died from COVID-19. As That's, you spoke, Bishop, mm -hmm. priests and religious are part of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could happen. Yes, every priest, and this is one of my own concerns, ah, every is, priest is at whatever. risk during this time. Mm -hmm. I cannot... Um, ask too much of priests. I have to understand as bishop what they have to endure. But every priest is going to be coming into contact with the grieving and so on. Pope Francis has made it very clear by taking to the streets of Rome himself that we want priests in the midst of their people, not only walking around the town saying prayers, but walking around the town meeting those who are grieving. 
you know, when people come and call you and say, gosh, you know, I'm so afraid. I was very moved when somebody told me the other day of stand, meeting a lady and they saw the lady, you know, her eyes full and they asked her, what's wrong, something wrong, thinking that something was wrong with the bag she was carrying or something like that. And she turned to them and said, I am so afraid. I am so afraid of this virus. And that person felt that they could take her hand, hold her around the shoulder, and comfort her. Now, that's a risk. <laughs> that's a risk. But let me make one thing absolutely clear. Any Christian who wants to live in a risk-free situation does not know what human living is about. There is no human living without risk. And risk is that area of life in which we exercise our faith. Risk to love. Risk to fall in love. Risk to get married. Yeah, all of that is risk. So I always am a little bit on edge these days when people say, we mustn't take any risks at all. Mm -mm. That's not Christian. Bishop, this is really, uh, uh, this is touching people very much. Eh? And then they said, you're going to say the funeral agent has the, um, the decision to make. But the priest, Always people are looking in. for mm. the concern of the priest. Because some of the funeral agents could be rough too. So <laughs> this has to be an understanding of compassion mm. and empathy and not this moralistic hand on you that gets you in a frenzy. Well, I'm not too sure what, what you mean by moralistic. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> no. putting down because the rule. moral, well, yeah, you're putting down a rule. That's not necessarily a moral thing. That's just a, a social um, rule for, the, for, for the, the context in which we are. How you respond to the rule, that's where the morality comes in. And here I come back. You have to take personal responsibility. And I hope that all of my priests will be able to really be a source of strength for people in these moments, right? And not run away from that responsibility. We have to help people to understand. But I'll be the first to admit, we priests are human, you know. And some priests who you're going to meet are more afraid of COVID-19 than the lay people are. And we've had to face that. They're facing that in England now. They're facing it in the States. And we, have, we will have to face it too. Um, you know, in, in Italy, 10 priests have been inf infected, and I suspect one or two of them may be already dead. You know, so. Oh, so we have to pray. So mm -hmm. we'll take a short break again, listeners and viewers. Um, we'll come back shortly. Thank you. Welcome back, listeners and viewers, to Conversations with Bishop Clyde Martin Harvey. And we thank all of you for your participation. This really feels like conversation, that people are really on point and are asking questions. And Bishop, I really appreciate the gentleness with which you are approaching the questions that people are asking. And um, I guess we look forward to that compassion well, going forward. I may be a priest, my dear, but I must also hopefully be a gentleman. <laughs> Christian. Okay, so we we move now to the gospel for the fourth Sunday of Lent, and hopefully this will bring a light for us in this time. The gospel is from St. John. As Jesus went along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents for him to have been born blind? Neither he nor his parents sinned, Jesus answered. He was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
as long as the day lasts, I must carry out the work of the one who sent me. The night will soon be here when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made a paste with the spittle, put this over the eyes of the blind man and said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, a name that means sent. So the blind man went off and washed himself and came away with his sight restored. His neighbors and people who earlier had seen him begging said, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, yes, it is the same one. Others said, no, he only looks like him. The man himself said, I am the man. So they said to him, then how do your eyes come to be open? The man called Jesus, he answered, made a paste, daubed my eyes with it, and said to me, go and wash at Siloam. So I went, and when I washed, I could see. They asked, where is he? I don't know, he answered. They brought the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. It had been a Sabbath day when Jesus made the paste and opened the man's eyes. So when the Pharisees asked him how he had come to see, he said, he put a paste on my eyes and I washed and I can see. Then some of the Pharisees said, this man cannot be from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how could a sinner produce signs like this? And there was disagreement among them. So they spoke to the blind man again. What have you to say about him yourself, now that he has opened your eyes? He's a prophet, replied the man. If this man were not from God, he could do, he couldn't do a thing. Are you trying to teach us? They replied. And you a sinner through and through since you were born? And they drove him away. Jesus heard they had driven him away. And when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of man? Sir, the man replied, tell me who he is so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you are looking at him. He is speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe, and worshiped him. Jesus said, it is for judgment that I have come into this world so that those without sight may see and those with sight turn blind. Hearing this, some Pharisees who were present said to him, we are not blind, surely. Jesus replied, blind. If you were, you would not be guilty. But since you say, we see, your guilt remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You know, last week I was very struck by the fact that the whole question of this woman at the well gave us so much rich meditative material in this time of COVID-19. And this story of the man born blind does exactly the same. It is rich as we explore the text in lessons that we need to learn. We could go through this passage in our retreat, taking a part of it every night for five nights. But I want to point out some things which I think are particularly important for us in our Grenadian context. As Jesus went along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, for him to have been born blind? And that is because among the Jews, there was a belief that all of these illnesses and so on, especially the ones from birth, are punishment. Punishment for something. So somebody must have sinned and God is now punishing them through the blindness of this man. And we are hearing exactly the same thing not only here in Grenada, but across the so-called Christian world. You know, people are saying God is visiting his wrath and his anger upon us. 
Is that what it's all about? Listen again. Jesus says, Neither he nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Wow. So that the works of God might be displayed in him. Think about that. Can we look at this and not see it as punishment for sin, but see it as an opportunity for the works of God to be displayed in us? We've seen that with the hurricanes that we've met. We've seen that even through the revolutionary period, you know, things that happened that we were afraid of, that we thought God punishing us and so on. But it is always amazing how if we just put on our Christian hat, if we think like Christ, then we we're able to see the works of God being displayed in us. And therefore, I want to invite you to really commit yourself, especially in the quiet moments when you're by yourself. You can't go to church. You don't want to take the risk. You're feeling sick and so on. To really consciously ask God, Lord, what are you trying to teach me now? I've heard many people talking about the lesson that, you know, God is in charge. Sure, I accept that as a lesson, yes. We human beings, and even yesterday we had a meeting of bishops, and in the course of that meeting I asked myself, how many of us as bishops really um, see how God is working in this trial that he sends us, in all the trials that he sends us, as Paul says, you know? so. You will know yourself what you have to learn. A friend of mine talked about having to be confined to home with the spouse that you would rather be far from. What do you learn in that? Having to be more concerned about your children, you know? Having to keep yourself open to the best advice about health, you know? Even when we say that you have to spend some time in the sunlight, you know. There we have, they, they say that to, in order to improve your immune system, you should be using more vitamin C and vitamin D. Vitamin D doesn't come because you go into drugstore and buy. Let's see if you have the money. But everybody can stand in the sunlight and let the sunlight raise the vitamin C in our systems, you know. But you know what? What about the old lady living next door who finds it hard to even get out of the house? How does she get some sunlight in the midst of all of this? You know? So that the glory of God may be displayed in us. The glory of God is not something in the heavens with cherubim and seraphim. St. Irenaeus makes it very clear to us the glory of God is humanity fully alive. And even in the midst of this virus that will kill many of us, we can be fully alive. Fully alive in love. Fully alive as the um, pandemic reflection that I read for you. Know that our lives you know, are in one another's hands. So we may not be able to reach out our hands, but we can reach out our heart, our words, and our compassion. Think about that. So this is the core point for me from this reading in the limited time that we have, that what is happening to us is not as punishment for sin, but so that God might be glorified in us and through us, and that after all this is over, we will be able to tell the stories. I'm looking forward to either some television programs or some um, books being written, you know, Jesus, the presence of God in the time of COVID-19, love in the time of COVID-19. That is what we seek to live. So that's one aspect from the readings which we have. The other thing is to recognize the man who comes from God and the man who is probably his own man. When the man is born blind, and he is healed, people immediately say, who healed you? You know, since he doesn't heal you on the Sabbath, he can't be from God. 
since he tries to, tries to heal you on the Sabbath, he can't be from God. We have to be very careful about those kind of judgments in these situations, you know, because what we know is Jesus is from God, and he may seem to break the rule, yes, but he does what God wants him to do in the particular situation. And this man finds himself healed because of the love of another. And here, I want to make a special plea for all the professional people, you know. They are the ones whom we have to listen to. They may not go to church on a Sunday. They may not be part of the, the witnessing group that we Christians are supposed to be. But they have a role to play. They have a role to play in being instruments of God for our healing. We have to pray for the grace not to be blind to those people around us who are doing the good work, doing the good work that is necessary in this context. It's not a question of saying, oh, they don't belong to the church. We thank God for them. If we get a chance, we greet them. I know one of the things I've been very touched by is how quickly people call in a radio station to say, I want to thank God for so-and-so. Hey, perhaps you could call in the radio station, this one or any other radio station, and thank God for the people you know who are on the front line who are healing others. Listeners and viewers, we take a short break. And when we come back, Bishop is going to move on because I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to do any further reflection, but Bishop has mm -hmm. asked to extend this program <laughs> for persons who would like to call mm -hmm. or to send in your comments yes, or ask your in. questions. Okay? So we take a short break now. Welcome back, listeners and viewers. Bishop wants to make an adjustment here. The mass is on. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> We're just making an adjustment in what we have to say because um, we have a little more time, so that is good. And you are still encouraged to call. And don't be afraid. Bishop is, he can take on. He can take on the questions you ask. Um, but Bishop, there has to, in terms of the man who was born blind, he, he was born blind to give God glory. But again, we have this judgment, as you say, when we see something happening to someone, we conclude it's some wickedness or so. That's why they, they have to go through this, and Jesus clarifies. But in, in, in the light of it, who opens his eyes? Not the people. Jesus opened his eyes. If he didn't go to wash, what would have happened to him? We don't know. We really don't know. You see, we are very quick to, to, to lay claims for understanding what we really don't understand. Why is this man of all the people born blind, the one who is healed, you know? There is a sense in which we always have to take the deeper lesson and not try to get caught up in a whole set of questions about what if. What if is something which very often we can't answer. What if you had married someone else? What if I had not become a priest? 
you know. Well, it's questions those, that need to yeah. be asked anyway. Um, well, I'm not too sure they <laughs> well, need to be asked. Sometimes <laughs> we ask it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes we ask. Yes. Good. So we want to look at what you have to say. Um, mm -hmm. If there's any other question coming up. Yeah, well, um, what I want... Oh, any question? No, not really. People oh, are okay. listening and they, yeah. they well, like then the let's, program. Let's move on. Yes to talk about something which is pertinent to Grenada. So you are listening from Trinidad. I presume you have a similar problem. And that is that one of the contexts, church contexts, in which a lot of people gather and which therefore is dangerous, is our Lenten missions. In some islands, those Lenten missions have been canceled, and we are going to cancel all our Lenten missions here. Um, I know some Lenten missions have already started, and therefore I am not going to um, push that right now. But um, certainly from next week, there will be no Lenten missions in the parishes. What we are doing is we are arranging to have a Lenten mission on radio and on Facebook from the cathedral. I'm going to ask a few priests to come in and lead the missions on Monday through Friday. I myself will take either the first or the last night. We haven't decided that as well as yet. Um, but it's an opportunity, wow, you know, I, when, when I think about it, I say to myself, wow, this is so great. An opportunity for you as church in Grenada to gather together in your homes, the house church, you know, and together to think about, to pray together, to read the scriptures together. I hope we'll be able to leave some time for you yourself to discuss a scripture passage in the home where you are. You know, I think it's, it can be a marvelous experience together. And the only thing we have to ask ourselves is, how do we follow up on that, you know, when this is all over? Um, also flowing from that is the question of what is going to happen at Easter, um, Holy Week. We haven't finalized that as yet, but in talking to my brother bishops um, yesterday on Zoom to the web, um, most of the bishops already know that they have to cancel the Christmas Mass as an open public occasion, because everybody comes to that. So what has been suggested and what I will try to do is, again, at the cathedral with a few people to come together, because I think the oils should be blessed on that day. Um, so we will have the priests who are present renew their promises, and the oils will be blessed. The distribution of the oils will have to take place at a later date. Um, we see how that works. With regard to um, Holy Week itself, Good Friday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Glorious Saturday, and Easter Sunday, um, that will that is still being considered. I don't. I think we will still be under some kind of a lockdown in terms of um, being able to have these public masses with hundreds of people. Um, but we're going to have to try and do something that everybody can look at from the cathedral and then allow for something happening in the parishes depending on what the situation is with the virus itself. So listen, follow 99.5, um, follow your Facebook page, listen to your parish priests and so on, and let's see how God will take us through this. Bishop, there's a concern. Um, the virus is not here yet. And well, that's, taking... that's not an accurate statement. Well, and, not and whenever, whenever that, cases. Yeah, okay. There's no confirmed cases okay, of the virus. Fine. But the virus is probably around, and that's... Well, we are not. But anyway, so what we're saying is that um, since we are sort of uh, projecting into the future mm -hmm. as to what is likely to happen, mm -hmm. So people will come or not come, you know. You saw what happened at the Mass um, when you invited mm. people on um, Saturday. Mm. And the crowd was not big. Mm. So people will make their choices, I feel. Yes, of course. You of know, course, to come course. or not to come mm. if they think they're in harm's way or... That's why I say risk is life, you know, and we, we have to respect that. We have to respect what the government is asking of us because this is how the virus, uh, the virus is transmitted. So even if people come, that they keep their distance, and that only in families do you sit together. Um, but once you are sitting next to people who are not part of your family, then you have to keep that distance. Okay. 
So for the Lenten missions, um, apart from the Lenten missions, I think Pope Francis was saying this whole thing, the opportunities that this time allows us. One, people are panicking already. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, people are anxious and people are suspicious in this time. Mm -hmm. So how do you inspire faith, really? You know, in people. Yes, we have to take the precaution, but how is a Christian called to live faith in this time? Taking the precautions mm -hmm. and at the same time encouraging others. Well, faith is not lived as something that you kind of just pull out of a hat and say, I have faith. Faith is lived and faith grows through the particular situations of life. As I was saying when we were dealing with that scripture passage, you know, the blind man is born blind, but then he meets somebody who evokes faith. A situation evokes faith. And I think the same thing will happen as we go along. There may be a moment when you're really panicking, and then something happens. You hear a hymn. Somebody comes to you, and engages you in some way, you know. Um, a lady afraid because she's 70 something years old and she knows that she's vulnerable. And then somebody comes and says to her, don't worry, I will help you. Those are the moments in which we really see faith at work. The faith of people where they come to realize, I live, no not I, but Christ lives in me with me, for me. You know, those are the real faith moments, I think. Mm -hmm. So the domestic church will come alive again. Yes, yes, and <laughs> we have to find be ways to do that. What should be happening, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is it's a good sign. I see you have something on Sunday Mass. Yes. That's a Sunday um, Last week we said that as long as the, the virus is not confirmed to be here, we will have Mass again mm -hmm. this weekend. And therefore the rules that applied last weekend will apply this weekend. Mm -hmm. That we do not have to come to Mass. I, as bishop, have the right, the, 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 the power, the privilege, to dispense you from the Sunday Mass obligation. But that does not mean that watching Mass on television is fulfilling your Sunday Mass obligation. You are dispensed from it, but what we invite you to do is to have a sense of communion with everybody else by watching a celebration of the Eucharist the one that I hope will come from St. Andrew's Church in Granville this Sunday morning. Um, and then what happens during the week, that's up to each parish priest to determine. But we are not going to encourage the big public masses again this Sunday, hold off on that until we're through the worst. Somebody commented that um, COVID seemed to be getting more publicity than the good news. <laughs> ah, that's a wonderful insight. That is a wonderful insight. And here, I think we as pastors have to ask ourselves a question, you know. How does it take a crisis for people to become focused on the good, you know? Um, now, the good news is not just what's in the Bible. If the good news is the God who is with us in all our different circumstances of life. And, uh, and anything that tells us God is here, anything that tells us Emmanuel is part of the good news. You know? So what I want to urge you is, and you can do this on this program, if you have a story to tell about how God has been good to you, God has been present in your life in the midst of this particular crisis, tell it. If you can't tell it to us on the radio station or through Facebook, tell it to your friends and neighbors, you know, because a lot of people will have stories to tell. So the good news is not only when somebody gets up and belts out a powerful homily or sermon. The good news is in the day-to-day -day experiences that we have in which we sense God at work in our lives the presence of God in our lives. Here I am among you, says Jesus, as one who serves. That's good news. That's really good news. Someone says the assurance that God loves us in the midst of this, because this is not the mm. only, mm -hmm. the only um, event, crisis, crisis that we have had to face. Mm -hmm. There were several crises, and this one is not 
Mm. Well, it's different, I guess, with the time, but it's not the only one. Mm. And we have seen in it, martyrs have been, have been, have been raised. Mm. Um, you have had cases with um, St. Damien. Mm. And in some cases, people have had to go into situations <coughs> doing the best they can, <coughs> not planning to get the, <laughs> the disease, but mm. it happens, you know? Mm. So the whole question of um, God loving us in spite and that everything works together for good, for those who love the Lord, yes. So, I think you want to do a prayer now. We, 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 we can take a break. Quest, yes, we take a break. But we want to thank all of you mm -hmm. for your comments. This, this really makes the program alive, and we're very, very happy. <laughs> so we'll take a short break now. And when Bishop comes, we come back. Bishop mm -hmm. is going to do the prayer mm -hmm. and say something small in Guyana. Welcome back, listeners and viewers, to this program. Very interesting program. Take a slightly different turn, but all in the interest of the common good and to give you the opportunity to be informed and to be instructed and to also have your response in, in this program. It's called Conversations. So unless you converse, you know, it, it, it goes flat. But we are so happy for all the responses, the questions and comments we have received. So Bishop would like to do the prayer. Everybody in their home, um, I think a church was given a copy of the prayer in the face of the COVID-19. So that prayer, we invite you to join us in your heart and mind to pray this prayer for mm -hmm. such persons and for our situation. Lord Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages curing every disease and illness. You have been with us as we face hurricanes and earthquakes in all our poverty and pain. Come to our aid now as we face the global spread of the coronavirus. Be with us in this time of anxiety, uncertainty, and sorrow. Heal those who are sick with the virus. Be their comfort and strength. May they regain their health through quality medical care. Deliver us from panic and fear, which prevent nations from working together and people from helping one another. Be with the doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected and who put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection, your wisdom, your peace. Be with the families of those who are sick or have died. As they worry and grieve, defend them from illness and despair. May they know your peace. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them the foresight to act with charity and true concern for the well-being of the people they are meant to serve. Give them the wisdom to invest in long-term solutions that will help prepare for or prevent further future outbreaks. Through this period of anxiety and pain, bring us all to a stronger faith, wider charity, and a deeper appreciation of your active presence in our lives. Lord Jesus, hear us and heal us. Amen. Amen. Now I want to take some time to deal with what is the second crisis in the region at this time. Our brothers and sisters in Guyana had elections about, well, oh, two weeks ago, and uh, they are now in a serious crisis. We 
the elections, as far as we are hearing from there, were, did not have a definitive conclusion. Guyana is divided up into regions, and one of those regions came back with results which were questioned by everybody, including the international observers. And it has led to a political stalemate. And if you know Guyana already, people have been killed since those elections. And Guyana could descend into a bloodbath at any point in time. A number of people have been very good in trying to resolve things and hold it together. And we have to pay particular tribute to our CARICOM leaders, led by Mia Motley, um, the Prime Minister of Barbados, and including our own Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Dominica, and the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. But they tried, and they were, to some extent, ignored by the people who hold power now. And since then, we have tried to send a less political delegation down, and everybody thought this was going to do the trick for a recount, but that hasn't happened. So Guyana is teetering on the edge of a precipice. And I want to ask all of you to pray for our Guyanese sisters and brothers. You who have Guyanese roots, because a number of Guyanese left Guyana and came to Grenada when things were rough in the days of Forbes Burnham, hold your former country of residence up before God. We feel that there is a need for CARICOM to resolve this, that if other foreign forces were brought in, it would really be a great disaster, not only for CARICOM, not only for Guyana, but for the whole region. So I invite you to take a moment now with me and just to pray for the people of Guyana, for their leaders, because Guyana, as you know, is divided into two principal races, people of African descent, people of Indian descent. And they have been struggling to hold things together. If that struggle ceases and things fall apart, all of us in the region will feel the consequences. Having Venezuela where it is now is bad enough. To have both Venezuela and Guyana in political crisis, God alone knows where that will go. And so, gracious Father, we turn to you today and we beg you to show your mercy to the people and the leaders of Guyana. Open their minds and hearts to see the situation in which they are. Like the man born blind, O oh Lord, let them hear your word saying that they need to understand that saying they see is not enough. And that if they say they see and they're not seeing, they're even more to be blamed for the chaos that might ensue. So Lord, raise up in Guyana now, we dare to ask you, men and women who will be able to bring things together, men and women who will be able to lift the eyes of all Guyanese to see the vision of God's victory and not simply their own petty political interests. Lord, may your spirit work so powerfully in that wonderful land of Kaitor Falls and Demerara Bauxite. May your spirit work powerfully there so that before this weekend we will see the bonds being loosed, the bonds that tie up Guyana in all kinds of conflicts. We see those bonds being loosed and the people of Guyana taking off on a path of life, justice, peace, and love. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Certainly, we are in the third week of Lent, and it's really, as you said, Bishop, in your shepherd's corner, it's a time for conversion. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what we think, mm -hmm. God is speaking, and he's speaking loudly enough for all of us, mm -hmm. not in isolation, yeah. but as a global so, community to the heart of man that has the same problem. Somebody everywhere. made an interesting point to me. They said that in the face of COVID-19, you don't need to make the Stations of the Cross. You are living the Stations of the Cross. I found that to be very, very insightful. And what one or two people have already done, and I think Pope Francis may well do the same thing on Good Friday. They have integrated their experience of COVID-19 
into the stations of the cross that they may make. And I think that, that is where, that for me, is where the authentic Christian faith is. When you're able to bring together your experience of life and the written word of the living God. So do you refer to that as the concrete experience? Where people are actually... I prefer to say, say the living the experience. Living. Concrete hard and immovable. <laughs> Concrete is real. <laughs> the living experience is the living flesh and blood. Okay. So we continue to pray um, that we will be prudent and discerning in all that we do and that we'll work together for the common good, as we heard from Bishop, and not lose heart. It'll be of good courage. God is in the boat with us. He will never Amen. leave us. Amen. Maybe you think he's sleeping. You may have to wake him up. But he may in fact be sleeping. But we get anxious. <laughs> <laughs> but he will awake. He will awake and say, oh, ye men of little feet. Mm. So let us put our confidence in him and not panic and run away, you know, like people with no hope. We do have hope. So thank you, Bishop, for, for being here today. Thank you. And we continue See you next to week. carry all our hope countries and people in our heart and we too to be very appreciative for the generosity of God to us not seeing it as a you know selected privilege but the grace that God has given us this time so thanks be to God we we'll see what unfolds thank you listeners thank you for all your comments and for viewers may God bless you join us again next week for conversations with Bishop Clyde Martin Harvey God bless you be safe be prayerful. Light amid encircling gloom.